We're going to continue on in this parabolic series. In this series, has been amazing. It's been challenging for me personally, been stretching my faith, and I really believe that it's a timely series that's really been stirring up a critical evangelistic spirit and a heightened level of urgency to reach the lost here at Inspire Church. I mean, look around. This place is full, but it's not just happening here on weekends, but it's really happening throughout all of the generations here at Inspire Church. And, and kids, we have over 500 kids in our kids ministry each and every over 500 okay say a prayer for the kids ministry or even better sign up to serve in the kids ministry this tuesday night at young adults come on 18 to 30 year olds young adults turn up baby we had led by becca and elijah we had 427 i repeat 427 young adults not in the clubs not at school no they were in the house of god worshiping praying we had over 50 baptisms that went down it was an amazing time so if you're 18 to 30 the best place to be is tuesday night here at inspired church i'm telling you this place by the end of the year who knows we might not have space because what god is doing in our young adult generation on Wednesday nights in our high school ministry, over the summertime, we, we had like 100 and 110, and I was so excited. And then we had an amazing camp. But then school year started. And I was like, okay, every school year, we usually drop down. So like if we had like 80 to 90 kids coming, that'd be awesome. But over the past three weeks since school has started, we've had over 160 students at each and every service. Hey, I'm telling you, these kids are on fire. It ain't, it ain't a fluke. They aren't still on the camp high. No, they are on fire for God. They're sending me pictures saying, hey, I started a connect group today at school over lunch. We read our Bibles. I said, yo, that's crazy. But that's amazing. In our junior high ministry, which meets during our services, our 6th to 8th grade, on Wednesday nights a year ago, they started discipleship groups. And last week, they had over 50 junior high students that came to church on a Wednesday night just to learn about God and learn how to be more like Christ. I'm telling you, God is up to something amazing. So welcome home if this is your very first time. Welcome to the family. We are so glad that you've joined us for this move of God. So before we hop in, I just want us to pray and prepare our hearts for the message today. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. God, we thank you for your spirit and your presence that is so tangible here in this room. God, I pray that it rests over these next few moments. God, I pray that every word that I say is a word directly from you for your children today. Lord, may I get out of the way so that you can shine through, Father. So open our ears, soften our hearts to receive the word that you have for us today. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen and amen. Come on, can we give it up for God one more time? And can we thank our worship team? I love these guys. Best worship band in the land, baby. Uh, but we are in part five of our parabolic series. We'll be in Matthew 25, verse 31. If you have your Bibles, you can go and open it up. Uh, but we are heading toward election day. So campaigning season is in full bore. The culture, the news, and society is trying to sway our values and belief systems. Yeah, yes, come on, somebody. It's getting crazy. It's getting wild. And guess what? It's probably only going to get more crazy and wild. And we're put in this situation. We're put in this pressure cooker decision moment where we can either put us on the right side of history or the wrong side of history. Right? If you want to be on the right side of history, you need to go and vote this way. If you, want, if you don't want to be on the wrong side of history, don't do this. Hey, you need to align with the right. You need to align with the left. Well, this parable we're going to take a look at today in Matthew 25, I, I really hope in my prayer is that it will change the way that we live. And that, yes, there is a right and a wrong side. Yes, there is a right and a left side. But it's not an elephant or a donkey that we align with, but instead we stand on the right side of eternity. We need to stand on the right side of eternity. When we go to the polls, we need to be looking for the right side of eternity, not just the right side of history. Because history will only be remembered for a moment. But eternity will be forever. And so my hope in prayer is that by the end of this, we can say, yes, I stand on the right side of eternity. You see, Jesus writes in Matthew 25, he says, 
But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his righteous throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. So there will be a moment in time where Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to do a separation where you'll either be on the right side like the sheep or on the left side like the goats and it continues in verse 34 then the king will say to those on his right come you who are blessed by my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world so there is a kingdom that was created and prepared for the sheep since the creation of the world so he's not delaying being like, oh man, I, I, I got to think more what, what this future kingdom will be like. He's not like, oh man, I, maybe I should add this, maybe I should add that. No, the creator of the universe created this kingdom since the creation of the world. And let me say, if he created all of this, the intricacies, the amazement, I mean, just go outside. Maybe not today because it's raining, but when it's sunny, just go outside and look around Hawaii. Okay, it is beautiful, the creation that he created. But that pales in comparison to the kingdom that he's created for his kids to inherit. I want to be a part of that kingdom. I don't know about you, but I hope that I'm a part of that kingdom. And he says in verse 35, for I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or, or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and, and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, away with you, you cursed ones. Into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. Uh-oh. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Verse 44, then they will reply, Lord, when do we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refused, everyone say refused. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. So in this parable, we see two different groups. We see sheep, we see goats, we see two different attitudes, we see two different lifestyles, and ultimately we see two different eternal outcomes. You see, if I were to summarize this parable, I would say who we live for will affect how we live now and where we'll live for eternity. Let me repeat that for online. Who we live for will affect how we live now and where we'll live for eternity. Who we live for should affect the way that we live. It should change the way that we live. You know, people will know who you live for by your actions out in the world. If, if you truly live for the king, then your actions should probably re reflect that you truly live for King Jesus. Because you see, if your actions aren't in alignment, then you're not showing that you live for the king. But you see, it doesn't just affect our, our, our now, but it affects our eternity. We need to live for the king. So today we're going to take a look at how to know if you're on the right side of history and what it looks like to, to live for the king. But, but before I get into that, I need to lay a foundation, okay? Because sometimes some of you, maybe you were reading this passage and you're like, oh man, all I got to do is good works and I can inherit this kingdom? All I got to do is, is go out and feed people and give people clothing and, and do good things. And, and then, then we, we do it out of fear and be like, oh, I don't want to not be with God. So I'm going to go do all these good things and I'll be good. Let me tell you, that is not how you receive salvation in an everlasting life. Okay, that is not, salvation is a free gift that is freely given. You can't earn it. You can't pay your way into heaven and be like, oh, can I give $500 to the church and I get a ticket to heaven? No, that's not how it works. It is a free gift that was freely given for anyone who accepts Jesus into their life. It says in Ephesians 2, God saved you by his grace when you believed. 
And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. So salvation, it is a gift that is freely given. But once we receive that gift of salvation, once we have said, hey, I I surrender my life to King Jesus. I am King Jesus' child. I'm going to be a sheep in his flock. Then our actions should start reflecting it. So we're going to take a look at what does it look, look like to live for the king. Do you see the first thing that we need to do that we can learn from this parable is respond to the good shepherd. We need to respond to the good shepherd. You see, our standing as sheep begin when we make the decision to give our heart and our life to God. You see, that's when it starts, when we enter into his sheepfold, is when we say yes to Jesus. We need to respond to this good shepherd. And I really believe that God has kind of been preparing me for this message. It's kind of crazy because a few months ago, I I got hooked on this song called Good Shepherd by Joel Barnes. Good Shepherd by Joel Barnes, okay? It's a song that I've been playing almost every single day. And man, I'm telling you, it is amazing. Watch the YouTube version, the extended version. And they go into an instrumental session where it's like, ah, and like, I want to cry. It's so good. But it is so good. But I love the lyrics of the bridge in the chorus. The bridge says, so all my days I will stay in the house of my father. And all my days I'll remain in the arms of the good shepherd. And the chorus is, oh, good shepherd, lead me home. Oh, good shepherd, I'm right where I belong. I belong here. And you see, one of the greatest challenges for non-believers and even believers, because this is a challenge that I've struggled with, is truly feeling and believing that we belong and are loved by the good shepherd. We don't feel worthy of the love that we hear about when we come in and we hear Pastor Mike preach, Pastor DJ preach about this Jesus who died for me. Man, why did he die for me? I am not worthy of him dying for me. He made a mistake for dying for me. Have you seen my sin? Have you seen my mistakes? Have you seen my past? How could, why would Jesus, that was a mistake. I am unworthy. And we have a hard time coming to this grip in this revelation that there is a God in heaven. There is a Father in heaven. There is a good shepherd that knows your name. There is a good shepherd that loves you. There is a good shepherd that wants to lead you beside still waters. There is a good shepherd that loves you and has called you worthy. Before you were even born, he called you worthy. He called you good enough. Why? Because he sent his son down to die for you. You see, we need to respond to the good shepherd. If we never actually respond to the good shepherd, then we'll always be a goat. We'll never actually be a sheep. We'll always be a goat if we never respond. So that's the first thing. We need to respond to the good shepherd. You see, we can show up to church on the weekend. We can go to young adults on Tuesdays. We can go to youth on Wednesdays. We can be around the flock and still never fully commit to God. And then we go through our week wondering, man, why have my actions not changed? Why have my situations not changed? Why am I still struggling in my marriage? Why am I still struggling with my thoughts? Man, I thought I was over this alcoholism, but why am I still struggling and tempted with this? Maybe, just maybe, we haven't fully committed to God. Maybe we've committed 90%. You see, the sheep and the goats, they were in the same thing. They, They were together. So you can come to church and be a go and be a part of it, but maybe you haven't fully committed to God yet. Because you see, when we fully commit to God, then it should start to reflect in our actions. It should start to reflect in our faith. In James 4, it says, come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. We can't live a loyalty that is divided between God and the world. If we're living, a, uh, if we're struggling with God and the world, then really we're living for the world. We have to fully commit ourselves to God. And this parable shows that our, our, once we do that, then our level and quality of our faith is ultimately revealed by our actions, that our actions need to come into alignment with the word of God. Our actions and our passions need to come into alignment with the things that the good shepherd desires, the passions that the good shepherd has, the actions that the good shepherd has. When we fully surrender ourselves to him, then we want to be like him. We want to do like him. We want to love like him. We want to speak like him. Him. Why? Because we have responded to the good shepherd. 
You see, in James 2, verses 14 through 16, it says, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, Good night, and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? What good does that do? Our faith, when we respond to the good shepherd, should show in our actions and the way that we live. You see, the sheep were sheep, not because of what they did. However, what they did was a result of who they were. What they did was a result of who they were. So we need to respond to the good shepherd. The second thing we need to do is recognize the needs of others. Online, we need to recognize the needs of others. In verse 37, it says, Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? So they're, they're, they're talking to the king. The king is saying, hey, well done for, for feeding me, for loving me, for, for serving me. And they're like, hold up. Like, we never saw you. Like, I think I would know if I saw you. Like, if we saw Pastor Mike on the side of the road with a hobo sign, I'm sure we would stop and help serve him. Right? We would recognize that. It would be a very recognizable person. Right? But these guys are like, hold on. I, I, I didn't see you. But the amazing thing is, they may not have saw Jesus, but they recognize a need. They recognize that something was wrong. They recognize that there was a problem. They recognize that there was a need, and maybe, just maybe, they would be able to help fill that need. Maybe they weren't able to fill all of the need. Maybe they didn't have all of the answers. Maybe they didn't have all of the solutions, but they recognize a need that they could help be a part of the solution. So once we, we surrendered to the good shepherd, once we've responded to the good shepherd, we must keep our heads up, our eyes open and attentive, and our eye, ears attuned to the promptings of the Holy Spirit around us. The problem is we live in a culture where our time is locked into a screen. We live in a culture where, where, where we love remote work. Okay, if I could re work remote, that would be amazing, right? Why? Because you are isolated. You don't have to deal with people. You don't, have to, you don't have to shower if you don't want to. You can just throw on Zoom and, and look good from here up, and it's all good, right? We're isolated from people. Or maybe we're, we're, our lives are so filled with responsibilities that we have little room for margin or an interruption or an invitation to join God in his mission, but these things can allow us to miss the simple needs of those around us. You see, these needs weren't anything crazy. He didn't say, hey, well done for giving a million dollars to the Peru missions team. He didn't say, hey, well done for adopting all of the puppies at the animal shelter. No, they were really simple needs. It was giving food, giving drink, giving clothes, hospitality, visiting, caring for people. Really simple everyday needs that us as believers, we could do if we simply saw. But you see, the problem is, sometimes we have a hard time recognizing the needs of others because we view the world through our eyes. But what maybe, just maybe we need is a perspective shift. So I'm going to invite one of my buddies up. Elias, everyone. Elias, come on up here, Elias. Clap it up. This is, as they say, my oos. This is my oos right here. Uh, this is Elias. This is my dog, okay? This is my dog, okay? So perspective shift. Some of us need a perspective shift. So Elias, face me. Face me. Good job. Are you ready? Are you nervous? Nope. Good, you should be. All right, here we go. Uh, can you take a step to the right? Good job. Clap it up for him. Clap it up for him. I know. So good. So good. Look at me. Stop looking at them. Stop looking at them. Can you take a step to the left, please? Good job. Get back to the middle. Can you take a step forward, please? Thank you. And then take a step backwards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Clap it up for Elias. Clap it up for Elias. Thank you. Thank you. Don't, don't leave. Don't leave. So did he do it right? He did. Almost. He did it right from your perspective. But you see, I told him to take a step right. But that wasn't right. But you see, if he turns in my direction and he takes my perspective and when I say, hey, Elias, can you take a step to the right? 
then we take a step to the right together. When I say take a step to the left, then we take a step to the left together. When I say take a step forward, we take a step forward together. When I say take a step backwards, we take a step backwards. Why? Because he has the right perspective now. But to take this, this illustration even further, if I said, hey, Elias, can you take a look up to the left side? Up to the left side, what do you see? Okay, you see, you see people in the door, but I see a guy wearing a white shirt and a hat. I see a guy wearing a white shirt and a hat. So you see, yes, we, we have the same perspective. Yes, we have the same alignment. But sometimes what we need to recognize, you see, I was behind Elias. And I said, hey, take a look at the left. But I, what I see and what he sees isn't necessarily the same thing. But you see, our God, yes, he has our back. Yes, our God is beside us, but also our God is in front of us, leading us and saying, hey, Elias, can you come with me? It's time to take a right over here. Hey, Elias, can you come to me? It's time to take a right over here. Hey, Elias, come over here. Come over here. Right over here. You see this guy in the front shirt? He needs Jesus, and you are the solution in Jesus that you need to take to him. You need to care for him. You need to love on him, and look at him. He needs some lunch, so you need to go get him some food. Thank you, Elias. We need a perspective shift. We need to see the world like Jesus sees it. We need to allow him to lead us and, be, and guide us through the power of the Spirit. We can't tone it out. We can't. But he will lead us if we allow him to. You see, maybe, just maybe, you've thought these same things with me, uh, like me. And so I'm going to be open, honest, and vulnerable, okay? Um, because I know you've thought these thoughts. Because I've thought these thoughts. You may never said these thoughts, but I know you've thought these thoughts. So I'm going to throw a couple things out there. And they may hit. They may not. Uh, and if they don't, man, y'all are holy and righteous. Praise God. So you can pray for me. But you know when you see the homeless person outside of Long's asking for money. And you walk by him and you think, if I give this person money, he's just going to go by it alcohol and drugs so i'm gonna help him by not giving money okay yeah y'all are giggling but i know you thought those thoughts because i thought those thoughts many times or maybe just maybe you see that homeless person and you look at them and you think ah, if only they made better life decisions yeah it's real but what could happen if instead of judging that person we have a perspective shift and we say, Lord, help me to see this person as your creation, as the value that you have created them, and show me how I can not only help them in the immediate, but how can I show them your everlasting love in the process? Maybe just maybe a person walks into church and they're not dressed up to our standards. Or maybe someone that we used to go to the club with walks into the church and we're like, oh man, I literally just saw your story. You were at the club last night. That doesn't align with the Bible. And we look at them and be like, oh, wow, that person really needs Jesus. Like, I need Jesus, but they really shine. Da -da -ba -ba, right? <laughs> and we could say it as a joke, but really we're judging and we're criticizing their walk. But what if we looked at them and we had a perspective shift and we, and we asked God, man, Lord, Give me an opportunity to bring them into the church community. Lord, give me an opportunity to invite them into connect group. Lord, give me the opportunity to walk alongside them so that they can experience your love today. You see, in Galatians 6.10, it says, Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone especially to those in the family of faith. So we need to respond to the good shepherd. We need to recognize the needs of others. The third thing we need to do is realize who you are serving. In verse 40, the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it for me. You see, the least of these might look different for all of us. The least of these for some of us might be the homeless people and why not? For others, the least of these might be our drunk uncle. For others, the least of these might be that our, 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 our former friend, our former best friend that stabbed us in the back. So we blocked him on all social media. That's the least of these. Maybe just maybe a, a good judge for the least of these or, or for all of those folks that say, I don't like people. I'm sorry, I, I don't want to serve. I just don't like people. I, I'm just not a fan. Like, pe I just don't like people. And you see, oftentimes those people that say, I don't like people, they like people. But there are certain people that they don't like that cause them to say, I don't like people. 
And maybe, just maybe, the I don't like people are the people that are the least of these to you. And the king said, when you serve the least of these, you are serving me. When you refuse to serve the least of these, you refuse to serve me. You see, it's great to recognize needs. It's important to recognize needs and be like, oh, man, that's a messed up situation. Huh. That's unfortunate. And we walk away. Like, you can recognize a need, but, but the actual action and the actual faith part is when we engage in being a solution to the problem. And we recognize, hey, maybe this need is presented here. Maybe this is an opportunity for me to serve others. But ultimately, maybe this is an opportunity for me to serve God. Maybe God has placed this person in my life so that I can serve God with all that I have. Because it's good to serve others. Because when there's an opportunity, God is calling me to serve and love others. Because I love Jesus. Because I love the Good Shepherd. I know the Good Shepherd served me. So I'm going to serve others. Why? Because everything that we do ultimately is service unto God, but oftentimes the opportunity to serve comes at the least convenient times, right? Like our friend comes up to us, hey, I'm so excited. I'm so jacked up. I'm going on my first mission trip. Like, yeah, but I need some money. And they're like, oh, that's awesome, dude. I'm so excited for you. But you see, I just paid rent. I just paid my electricity bill. I just paid my car payment. I got my car insurance coming out. And I only got $20 in my bank account. And my fridge is looking kind of light. So I got I to gotta make that thing stretch. You know what I'm saying? Dollar menu uh, that's non-existent no more. Um, so uh, that's awesome, dude, right? That's a little inconvenient. There's times when, when we get a phone call from our friend and they're like, oh, dude, oh, me and my wife have just been in it. And they're like, oh, dog, me and my wife just got out of a fight before you picked up. Like, I shouldn't be ministering to you. I need ministry. Like, I got my own problems. And now I have to minister to you? Oh. Or maybe, just maybe, it's you, you take your kids to work and it's, you were, had to get them all ready or to school. And, and one, of the, one of the kids forgot their backpack. So you got to go home and get the backpack and take it there. And it's like, your day is crazy. And you're like, oh, man, I got a lot of work to do and I'm already running behind. And then you pull up to your parking and the person that pulls in is that person that gets on your nerves each and every day. And you're like, Lord, this is going to be a long day. Right? The opportunity to serve and love others often come at the most inconvenient times. And I was trying to think of a time, and ironically, it was this week. Uh, uh, like, uh, like I said, God's been doing amazing things in Inspire Youth, and it's been so cool because I know it's not even me. Like, I know it's all God, okay? And, but I've been encouraged. I'm like, hey, if you guys want to start things on your campuses, I am all in for you. I will do whatever I got to do for you. And so I received a text on Tuesday from a student and one of my leaders, and they said, hey, we're starting a Bible club on campus this Wednesday. I said, oh, that's awesome, but really inconvenient. Uh, my Wednesdays, I have a lot of meetings on Wednesdays. Um, and, and, like, I haven't really told our kids, how about we push it a week? They're like, no, we're just going to do it. I said, okay, I'm probably not going to be able to make it, but you guys have a good time. And then Wednesday morning comes, one of my students texts me. He's like, hey, I'm not able to make it. I said, oh, Lordy. Oh, Lord, we're about to launch a group, and there might not be no kids there, so I should probably show up and see what happens. So I was like, okay, I'll rearrange some things, I guess. Even though it's inconvenient, I'm going to rearrange some things. So I, I rearrange some things. I'm driving down to Campbell. It's like a 25-minute drive. I'm thinking like 25 minutes down, 25 minutes back, 45 minutes. Like, I'm for an hour and a half to two hours. I have to do this? Really, God? Really? For maybe two or three kids? And then I'm walking to the classroom with one of my students who didn't even end up going to the group because they had to do something else. So we're walking and I'm dragging my feet. And I'm like, oh, there's probably going to be maybe one kid, maybe two. Man, if God is good, maybe three. And then I walk into this classroom. And there were 12 students there and five teachers and advisors there who were excited and ready to bring Jesus to their campus. And God lovingly slapped me upside the head. Just love his way. And he said, Darian, have you forgotten the prayers that you've prayed? The, the, the faith that you have had for these students to do the thing that you wanted to do? And yet you are the one acting like it's inconvenient for you now? But he reminded me and said, hey, it's not on you to make it happen. But I'll make it happen. 
All I need you to do is be faithful. All I need you to do is steward what, you, uh, what I have blessed you with. And if you can steward the little things, then I can put you in charge of the more. We need to recognize, realize who we are serving. Who we are serving, Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You see, we're in the, in the connect group season, and it's one of my favorite seasons of the year. Getting into community, getting into a connect group was one of the m- most important things that I did because it tied me into the community of Inspire Church. Like, uh, once I was in a connect group, there was no leaving. Because I was into and ingrained and I was doing life with these people and they were encouraging me. So if you haven't got into a connect group, now is the time to get into a connect group. But what would happen if all the connect groups at Inspire Church, they didn't have to get wrought up. We didn't have to do like a specific time and season. But every connect group gathered at your next gathering and said, hey, what are the needs in our community? What are the things that we can be a part of? What are the things that we can help with? And what I love about the needs is that they weren't difficult needs. It was feeding people, it was giving them water, giving them clothing, visiting people. But what would happen if all of the connect groups at Inspire Church at some time over the next few months, you guys gathered and you say, hey, what is the need that we could be a part of? And then you guys plan a day where you go out and you help fulfill those needs. You help fulfill those needs. You see, outreach isn't an outreach Pastor Randy only thing. It isn't a share aloha season one month push. Oh, we did our outreach for the year. God's going to be so happy for us. No, it's an everyday thing. How can we serve others in our everyday little things? How can we gather as groups and serve others and bless the community? Like they said, the Peru mission trip, they went out to bless others. And guess what? They were probably blessed and refreshed more than the people that they actually blessed. And to bring it a little bit closer to home. I'm sure you have all seen the gun violence that's going on on the west side of the island right now. The nonsense of young people, of youth, getting guns in the first place. How they get them, I have no idea. But secondly, pulling guns at school, pulling guns out and shooting people for nonsense reasons. As a youth director, as a youth pastor, it breaks my heart. Because I have students that go to Nanakuli. I have students that go to Waianae. My parents live on the west side. But what would happen if we as believers, we didn't organize a big rally. We didn't organize a march. But we as believers just went out and started showing the love of Jesus to that community. What impact could we make? If we went out to the elementary schools, to the junior high, to the high school, and we just served food to the kids. And we said, hey, we don't even have to use the word Jesus. Because I know Jesus in school sometimes like, But we just said, hey, man, you're loved. Hey, you're doing a great job. Man, I'm so proud of you for getting into school today. Hey, hey, you got a great future. You got a great plan. Hey, man, I love that smile. And we just started giving Jesus' love to these young people. Imagine the kind of change that could happen on the west side. Imagine if we started doing that in Central Island. The kind of change that could happen. The kind of change that could happen in town. The kind of change that could happen on the North Shore. The kind of change that could happen on the Windward side. Why? Because we recognize the need, but we also understood that, that we needed to serve our community. That when, when we serve our community, ultimately we're serving Jesus. We're serving Jesus. And the last thing that we need to do, we need to rely on the good shepherd. We need to rely on the good shepherd. I have a picture of of some sheep and goats. Sheep and goats. You see, Middle Eastern sheep and goats look very similar with floppy ears and long off-white and reddish-brown wool, right? They're not the, like, cute little white Sheep, like, bah, right? That we think of, like Mary, like Mary sheep. Mary had a little lamb, like those kind of sheep. Like these ones are a little more rustic, a little more rough and tough, right? <laughs> and how do you know the difference between them? I don't know. But, uh, but goats do have horns. Okay, they have horns. And then the other ones are sheep. And they would often be put together to graze, but were separated at night because the goats needed a warm shelter and, and the sheep's preferred open air. But they look very similar. They do a lot of the same things, but... There's some important characteristics that differentiate them that I think there was a reason why, why Jesus spoke about this separation of sheeps and goats. You see, sheeps, 
They're not the smartest of animals. They have poor eyesight. Sheep are highly dependent on the shepherd for survival. Right? The shepherd keeps them safe from animal attacks. You don't see on the animal channel, tonight, we have a sheep defeating a bear. Watch as the sheep pounces on the bear. No, you don't, you don't see that kind of stuff. Right? Oftentimes, the animal, rah, on the sheep. But it's up to the shepherd to defend them and, and defend his flock. The sheep, they often wander off because they have bad eyesight. So like, rah, 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 rah. And they'll just wander off and the sheep has to go and grab them and bring them back into the sheepfold. You see, sheep, they, they, they eat plants and grass. And so before they, they enter into the patch because they don't know the difference, the, the shepherd has to go out throughout the pasture and pluck all of the poisonous plants. He has to take them all out so he can send his sheep in to eat. And then you have the goats. You have the goats. The goats, they were, all, they were honestly good for the sheep because they were good leaders. They were sure-footed. They could, they could handle rough terrain. And so the, the, the goats, and the, they would kind of lead the sheep. The goats would be going and they like, bah, bah. And the sheep would just kind of follow around. But the problem with goats is that they're stubborn and independent. They're stubborn and independent. And you see, the sheep, they need their shepherd. They need their shepherd for survival. They need their shepherd for direction. They have to listen for the voice of the shepherd because their eyesight's bad. But you see, goats, they think they can survive independently without the shepherd. They're stubborn. They may not always listen to the shepherd. They may wander off from the shepherd and be like, okay, I'm good. I got this. I'm a, I'm a goat. You know, I'm a goat. But in the kingdom of God, you see, the sheep need to rely on the good shepherd. We can't be like a goat and try to do our own thing. We can't be like goats and be stubborn and be independent. No, the sheep, they need their good shepherd. They need to hear and listen to the voice of the good shepherd because we may have 20-20 vision in the physical, but in the spiritual, sometimes our eyesight is all out of whack. And so we need to listen to the voice of the Good Shepherd for guidance. We need to listen to the voice of the Good Shepherd for direction. We need to listen for the voice of the Good Shepherd when the Good Shepherd says, Hey, you need to stop and rest in this moment. Hey, I need you to move. There's something coming. I need you to move. Just listen to my voice. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to guide you. And who is the Good Shepherd? It's Jesus in John 10. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him. And he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. In verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and they know me. Just as my father knows me and I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too that are not in the sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. You see, we can rely on the good shepherd because he will provide us with all that we need. He will not ask us to do something that he hasn't already sacrificed and done himself. He knows us and simply asking us to listen to his voice and be obedient because it's better to be an obedient sheep than trying to be a goat in the kingdom of God. You see, there's a lot of sheep in this place. You've committed, you've surrendered, fully given your life to God. And that's amazing. That's amazing. But the thing that I want to leave you with is that sheep like to wander off. And you see, wandering off isn't something that, that we do intentionally at times. It's kind of like when you go to the ocean and you're in one of those floaty, floaty rings. And you're just sitting. You start by the shoreline and you're just sitting, cruising. Yeah, this is so much fun. Woo, the waves. I'm on a wave pool. And then you open your eyes, and next thing you know, you're far off from the shoreline. You didn't have to swim away. You didn't have to do anything. You were just sitting, and you drifted off. And you see, that can be like us sometimes. We can be close with God. We can be right near God. And then something happens. Football season hits. And the Pittsburgh Steelers play. Huh. Hey, you know what? Maybe I'll skip church this week. I, I got to watch the Steelers. 
and then life happens oh man my sports my kids sports schedules got they're on Sundays now oh man here you know we'll miss two to three weeks it's okay we'll, we'll watch online and then our life starts to get busy in our, and we get, a, we, get, we get a great raise at work and more responsibility, but we're like, oh man, now I've just got too much responsibility. I can't go to Connect Group anymore. And then all of a sudden we look around and we're like, wait, where's the good shepherd? How did I wander off from the good shepherd? But my prayer for you is, is, is like the song that I sang that today we can come back to the good shepherd that we can say all my days I will stay in the house of the father all my days I'll remain in the arms of the good shepherd oh good shepherd lead me home oh good shepherd I'm right where I belong I belong here I belong near the good shepherd and for some of you in this room you're not dumb like the sheep but maybe you're stubborn like the goats you're independent like a goat. You're committed to God, maybe 80%, but you're like, ah, this part, nah, I'm good. I'm going to keep it to myself. Maybe you even come to church. You're in and around the community. You're a part of what God is doing, but you haven't fully committed your life to God. You're here on Sunday, you're like, oh man, this feels so good. Like, I I'm just so empowered. I'm so inspired. Like, I'm about to go do something different. And then Monday rolls around, and you're like, ah, never mind, I'm good. I'll, I'll, I'll start next Sunday. And we get back to our life. We get back to the ways that we'd be living. But unfortunately, now we're standing at the edge of the cliff. And there's no way forward. There's no way backward. And we're all alone. But you see, there's a good shepherd that sees you there's a good shepherd that knows your name there's a good shepherd that loves you and like he said there are sheep not yet in his sheep fold and he was thinking of you when he said that that today is the day that you get to join the sheep fold of God that Jesus is going to be your good shepherd. Maybe you feel it right now in your heart. Maybe you're hearing something right now. Well, that's the voice of the good shepherd saying, son, daughter, it's time for you to come home to me. It's time for you to surrender your life to me. It's time for you to get your life right. And the only way you can get your life right is through me. Why? Because I paid the price on the cost for you. So you don't have to be like the goats. You don't have to suffer in hell, but I've already paid for it so you can have everlasting life. So you can have a greater purpose and a greater plan for your life. I've already paid that and all I need you to do is receive the free gift today and when you receive that free gift today your life will never be the same I'm going to change you from the inside out I'm going to give you a plan and a purpose I'm going to give you a new identity as a son and a daughter of the king you are going to be my sheep and all I need you to do is be obedient and listen to my voice so if that is you today, you're ready to give your life to Jesus with every head bowed, every eyes closed. On the count of three, I just want you to slip your hand up in the air. What's going to happen? I'm going to count the hands and then we're all going to pray a prayer together. He's going to come into your heart. He's going to change you from the inside out. He's literally going to fill you with his spirit to help you accomplish all that he has for you, to help you serve others, to help you love the least of these. You don't have to do it on your own anymore. Because the Spirit of God will be living and residing within you. And like I said, He's going to be behind you, washing your back. He's going to be beside you, walking alongside you. And He's going to be in front of you, leading and guiding you. So if you're ready to say yes to Jesus today, on the count of three, I just want you to slip your hand up in the air. Here we go. One, Jesus loves you. Two, He has a great plan and a great purpose for you. The Good Shepherd is calling you home today. He wants you to be a part of His sheepfold. Here we go. One, two, three. If you're ready to say yes to Jesus, just put your hand up high in the air. High in the air. Yeah, I see that hand. One. Yeah, two right there. Yeah, three right there. That's amazing. Four. Yeah, five right there. Yeah, six right there. Seven, eight. Yeah, nine right there. Yeah, ten. Yep, eleven. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, twelve right there. Yeah, thirteen right there. 
Yep, 14, yeah, 15 right there. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, yeah, 24, 25, 26, 27, yeah, 28, 29, 30, 31 right there. Yep, 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 keep your hands up. Yeah, 32, yeah, 33, 34, 35, yeah, 36, yeah, 37, 30. I see you, buddy. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. You guys can go on and put your hands down. Almost 40 people in this room. Come on, can we clap it up for God? And I want everyone to preach this prayer after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son down to die for me. It's by his blood that I'm washed clean. Today, I choose Jesus. I choose your plan and your purpose for my life. So come into my heart and change me from the inside out mold me and shape me into the person that you've designed me to be you are my lord you are my savior and i'm your child the old is passed away and the new has begun i love you jesus in his mighty name amen amen and amen come on can we give it up for all those who gave their lives to the lord